I'm Sierra, obviously. Hopefully you knew that by now. And I'm here with David Fletcher and Sally Van Dieven, two of our most amazing testers. Okay, so like Sierra said, we my name's Sally Van Dieven. I'm a tester for Black Hills. Been with Black Hills going on three years now. Uh, before that, I was a blue teamer and often used sys internals tools that we're going to talk about today and know how useful they are as a system administrator. Um, Dave, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, so my story is very similar to Sally's. Uh, I spent 20 plus years uh, doing blue team work for the Air Force. Uh, and I've been working for Black Hills for about three years now. Um, Sally and I have one thing in common. If you look to Sally's right, you'll see two things hanging on her wall. Those are the <laughs> same things that are hanging on my wall. Aww. We're both very proud graduates of STI, and we love the Sands Institute. Uh, but I used Sys internals all the time uh, as an admin. Yeah, so um, this book, we kind of took the liberty of changing the title, but the, the book exists. It's a wonderful book. I have this book. Um, it's written by the author of the Sys Internals tools and using them for troubleshooting. But as we're going to talk about, you can also use them for poning. So it's uh, the tools are great for attackers as well. So let's see. So the Sys Internals tool suite uh, was developed by Mark Rasinovich. Uh, and Mark is a Microsoft Azure CTO uh, and co-author of the Windows Internals books. Uh, and he wasn't always uh, a Microsoft employee. He spent quite a bit of his time making Microsoft mad. So uh, not only did he de develop tools that made Windows easier to use, but he also exposed some of the wonderful uh, fallacies in Windows itself. So the different difference between Windows NT, uh, workstation and server, uh, he exposed that a registry change could make Windows uh, workstation into Windows server. Uh, so uh, he generated quite a bit of rage with Microsoft before he joined them in 2006. And I think that was an excellent move by Microsoft uh, because he's a very knowledgeable uh, software engineer and he is a very great public speaker. Uh, I've actually seen him speak a number of times uh, from back in my blue team days at uh, Sys Inter or the Microsoft Tech Ed conferences. Yeah, he's written multiple books too. The, this, um, the Windows internals books, there's part one and part two, but there have been several editions of those. And those tell you pretty much everything you need to know about Windows. They're to very... include some hacker fiction as well. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yes, he's written uh, Zero Day and um, several several fiction books. Yeah. So um, the Sys Internals Tool Suite. He and a colleague developed these tools early on, like Dave already mentioned, and uh, they are they were written. To, for system administrators, for administering the system. A lot of these functions are now built into PowerShell. Um, but each one of these tools is a standalone tool and um, they each do something very well. Some of them are, are super well known. We're gonna talk about a lot of those and others are not so well known, but there's, I, I didn't count them, Dave, but I wanna say there's 50 at least. It, yeah. It, tools it's, in, it's this, in this around. suite. 50 different tools, and if you use your imagination, I'm sure you could find a nefarious purpose for every one of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Notice the excellent web design. <laughs> Courtesy of the, web, of the Wayback Machine. Yes. <laughs> Marketers well, love awesome web design. Yes, last updated <laughs> 1999. Um, but the Sys Internals tools are free for anyone to download. So you just Google Sys Internals and you'll find them right away. So Microsoft sucks, we're attackers, why should we care about this stuff? One, all of these binaries are signed by Microsoft. And as an, as an attacker, what am I on your network? 
I'm not really an attacker. I'm just a rogue sysadmin. So if I can find tools that are uh, useful for me for attack that might avoid detection, that is absolutely the condition that I want to find myself in. And we always talk about living off the land. And typically what we're talking about is using PowerShell or Wimic or the net tools. But in more and more situations, we find organizations are instrumenting use of those specific tools. And using the SysInternals tool suite might give you another opportunity to avoid detection on that target network. Uh, so how do we get a hold of them? We can download them from Microsoft using our browser. We can execute directly from live.sysinternals.com or maybe the admins have left a copy laying around for us. So <laughs> many More of you often than not, that's the case. <laughs> yeah, in some organizations, uh, we've seen them exactly like Brian just mentioned. Maybe it's part of the base image. So we go poking around on the file system and, oh, wow, there's an entire suite of SysInternals tools that are available to me that I can use for whatever I want to try. So I might be able to avoid detection. I might be able to bypass uh, application whitelisting depending on how it's implemented on the target system. But it's all valuable. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go through some of some of the tools that we use most often from this tool suite. Um, this first one, probably everybody's heard of. Certainly, if you're a pen tester, you've heard of it. But if you're a sysadmin, you've probably heard of it, heard of it at least, and and very likely used it. PS Exec is a uh, it's known as an attack tool because what it does is allows you to re to execute commands remotely on another machine. So it's it's been built into other exploitation frameworks like Metasploit, uh, Cobalt Strike, and others. Um, here, these these examples show you that you can run an interactive command shell on another uh, system. You have to have credentials, of course, but credentials are usually too hard to come by. Um, but you can execute commands directly on the other system, or you can, the second uh, screenshot there shows an example of how you might host a, a batch file that does whatever you want it to do, um, host it locally on a file share, and then run that batch file on the remote system. Sorry, I was responding. Somebody said, is that a season password? I said, I was going to say users. You can't live with them. You can't live without them. I know, <laughs> but it's a that good a password. <laughs> so, uh, in addition to PS Exec, one of the mo other more popular uh, SysInternals rooted tools is Procdump and Process Explorer. Process Explorer is gives you a more intuitive task manager sort of feel. So you can see the process tree. Uh, as you're executing uh, uh, applications, you can watch things spawn, you can watch things die. Uh, and then proc dump uh, allows you to dump memory from the process. So both of them give you that functionality and it is available in uh, Windows versions or current Windows versions, but there are things that I can't do with those current Windows versions. For instance, if I use the task manager to try to dump memory from, say, the LSAS process, I right click and create my dump file, and I have no option about what I'm going to name that dump file. In contrast, with Proc Dump and Process Explorer, I can name it whatever I want. Like cheese.wiz. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cheese.wiz. Sometimes I can't name or change the extension, so proc dump won't, won't allow you to uh, change the extension itself, but you can change the file name. And in uh, instances, we found that organizations look for lsas.dmp to show up on the file system and alert on it. So yeah. if you can avoid that, that situation, it makes your life all that much easier. Yeah, and no looking for cheese whiz. On no, the nobody system. ever looks for cheese whiz. <laughs> and in environments where uh, you have older Windows operating systems, Windows XP doesn't exist anymore, right? You've never seen a Windows 2000 box on a on a network recently, right? 
glass. Oh, pick me. I have. <laughs> Those things are still alive and well, and they don't have that integrated uh, task manager functionality. So I can use one of these tools to dump LSAS for me, especially where I don't have access to things like PowerShell, uh, where I might be able to use uh, the uh, proc dump.ps1. Any other thoughts, Sally? Well, I just want everybody to know that we put cheese whiz and tater tots on here because um, it's a well-known fact that that's John Strand's favorite meal. <laughs> tater tots with cheese whiz. So. Um, Ashish had a question. Can these tools be used for privilege escalation? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, that's typically what you're going for with uh, pro use of proc dump and proc, proc explorer. Uh, usually you're going to dump that LSAS process. Obviously, on, on recent Windows versions, Windows, Windows 10 and uh, uh, 2012, it's not going to bear as much fruit. Uh, but once I've dumped the process, I might be able to analyze that process with Mimikatz and then get actual creds that escalate my privileges on uh, a local network. In addition, you don't want to be too restrictive on how you're going to use these tools as well. So if, they're, if you're on a server that has a, a process that say you look at the services control panel applet and you notice that something is logging on using domain credentials, maybe I wanna dump the memory for that process. And then we're gonna talk about strings later uh, on in our presentation, but I can there any credentials in that memory dump uh, where I wouldn't be able to use Mimikatz against that particular uh, memory segment. So I might still be able to find really great stuff. Okay. Yep. Um, and we have a couple other questions. Um, Brendan asks, is there any way to slow it down so that you can see what it is? I have stuff that just blips and it's gone. Yeah, you can change on Process Explorer, I assume you mean. You can change the um, the refresh rate or the, what do they call it? The view rate or whatever. So, and you can pause it as well so you can, when you see the process you want uh, to to examine, you pause pause the GUI, and it won't. Okay. Be I see that Dominic asked if there's a uh, equivalent to the uh, Linux Unix-based strings command. We're actually going to talk about that in a couple of slides. Yep. Oh, sweet! And the answer is yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Oh, more questions? we have some other questions. We have another question from Yarn and from Brian. Do you want to read those or do you want to move on and get to those later? We might as well read them. OK, so Brian says these also can be used to avoid detection with PowerShare logging. That was a question. So I tried to question. Yeah, that's, a, that's an accurate statement is what it is. Mm -hmm. OK. <laughs> if, yeah, if the organization is doing PowerShell logging and I want to avoid PowerShell at that point, this is a great way to get around it. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, and Jason points out there are YouTube videos that cover slowing it down so that you can see that if you want to look that up on YouTube. And Yaren says, PS exec installs a service on a remote system. Sometimes that service points to the executable, which is in the C windows on the remote machine. And sometimes it's in the C windows system 32. Under which cases is the PS exec service file copied to each one of those directories? That's hmm. a great question. That is I a great question. And, uh, and figure it out just like you would. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if there's somebody, in, I'm forwarding that to everybody. If there's somebody that has a good answer to Yaron, hopefully I said that right, um, go ahead and put it in the questions. But all right. All right. We're good. Onward. We're good. Okay. Okay. The next one is uh, my favorite tool. Is it your favorite tool, Dave? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yes. Yeah. So, AD Explorer, Active Directory Explorer. Um, I love this tool so much that I actually dedicated a whole blog post to it. I have the link up there at the top. But um, this tool uh, basically lets you view the entire Active Directory database, the schema. It, it's, it's, so, it's the first thing I do when I get inside a network. It, you, any authenticated user, any domain account can access a domain controller and uh, open up AD Explorer, create a snapshot for offline viewing, or look at the live uh, database. Um, it doesn't let you see anybody's password. 
um, but it lets you see so many things that give you situational awareness on the network. It's a GUI tool, um, but you can, as you see in the snapshot below, you can run uh, from the command line, you can create a snapshot. So if you only have an interpreter session on a machine, you can create an Active Directory snapshot. This is running a local copy of AD Explorer, but you could remember you could run it from the live.sysinternals.com uh, UNC path. So you don't even need that on the local host to get a snapshot. And then, I mean, it's a way, it's a way to avoid using net commands. You can, you can really get inside an admin's head when they designed act, their Active Directory domain you can look at this snapshot and really get an idea for how things are put together, especially in a large organization with maybe multiple domains in the forest and, and so many different OUs. I mean, this is a small test OU that we're showing you here, but um, most organizations are much more complicated than this. And so this gives you a nice graphical view of how the organization is laid out. Yeah, and go back one, Real quick, did you cover command line capture? Yep. Okay, my bad. Well, I yeah. didn't talk about the syntax here, but so you, you run AD Explorer, except EULA means you're accepting their user agreement so that pop-up doesn't show up. And then dash snapshot means just take a snapshot, don't connect to the domain controller to show me live stuff, just create a snapshot. And the double quotes are the connection string. And if you leave it empty, it's just taking your default domain controller um, that your computer is joined to, um, but you can put a server name in there, a domain controller server name. And then the, the snap.dat represents just the, the name of the output file that you want it to write to. So Timothy asked, can AD Explorer's snapshot be accessed or read via PowerShell? If you spend some time reverse engineering it. Uh, yes. Go ahead, Sally. As far as I know, that's not possible. Maybe someone else knows better. Dave's Googling it. Nope, nope. That's oh. that's Sierra Googling it. Oh, okay. No. Trust me, I've Googled it quite a number of times because there have been opportunities where I have an AD Explorer snapshot, uh, but then you know you get kicked out of the network. Uh, what's really nice is you still have that information offline. Right. So, what do I do with an AD Explorer snapshot and I have a user list in front of me and I can't explore those users? I cry. You can actually, Dave, um, run strings against the snapshot. Oh, and nice. it's, it's not beautiful, but you can pull usernames out, same account names out and email addresses out. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, Yarin asked, how does AD Explorer work under the hood? It, if it's not supposedly uh, net commands. I believe that it's using the native API for LDAP to talk to the domain controller. It is not using the net commands to collect all of those attributes. Um, and then Paul had another comment. AD Explorer is a proprietary format. Unfortunately, it can only be accessed properly using AD Explorer. Someone really should reverse engineer it. <laughs> Somebody definitely should. That would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. Get on it, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there are threads on uh, the Empire uh, GitHub where people want to use uh, AD Explorer snapshots for Empire. Uh, obviously, it's not going to get you that session information, uh, but it does get you a lot of information that's useful. Mm -hmm. So expanding on that situational aware awareness, uh, we have things that we always do nearly every time we use Active Directory Explorer. Uh, those include uh, elevated group enumeration. So not only are we going to look at the uh, Active Directory Schema Administrators group and the domain admins and enterprise admins, but we're going to look at the entire group structure to see if we can figure out what the hierarchy is on that target network. So we're looking for help desk admins, uh, server admins, desktop administrators so that we can understand how we might be able to use that hierarchy against the organization to escalate privilege. On top of that, we can look at those OUs. Sally mentioned, uh, you know, large organizations have complex OU structures and 
what do we typically use those OUs for? Usually it's to apply group policy. So we might be able to identify where those policies are, are applied and it might give us an intuition into uh, what that organization is trying to do. In addition, if I'm in a large organization, what are the chances that that organization is subdividing network administration based on location? So I might be able to see specific, uh, or I might be able to correlate specific admins with specific OUs and, uh, and subordinate uh, machines and users that might be useful for formulating uh, additional attacks. Other things that we typically look for is naming convention. So I want to look for things that I might be able to log into as a normal user. Citrix, uh, terminal servers. I also want to identify things that maybe are infrastructure that you haven't properly segmented away from the rest of the network. Uh, how many people apply rigorous controls to VMware. Do server admins get to log in? Can they access domain controllers from that console? If I'm a server admin and I can access that, that console, do I need to be a domain admin? Absolutely not. All I have to do is be able to read the, the data store, grab a snapshot, and then go pull, uh, pull hashes off of that instead of escalating all the way to domain admin. Uh, very, very important things that we can do to try to sidestep uh, the authorization controls in Windows Active Directory rather than going straight at domain admin. Uh, in addition, if I've got access to vSphere console and I can access the data store, do I even need domain admin privileges? Right. No, yeah, I have access to the entire data center. So I can probably download the entire file server or a SQL database disk and have my way with your organization. Um, I think David did something to his mic because it kind of like got futzy. Did you um, cover something? Am I better else? now? Yeah. I, I turned know. my laptop. I don't know. Stop moving your, and it moves your camera and it's like, ugh. Um, I get excitable. <laughs> he, he does. Um, did Mike ask this question a minute ago? What event ID does that create on the DC? That one I do not know off the top of my head. Okay. When you create a snapshot, is that yep. what the, uh-huh. Uh, it could, uh, it's a lot of LDAP queries, right? Yeah. So the, I would could, assume that would, it, it should create a bunch of noise because okay. it's literally creating a one-for-one -one copy of all the attributes uh, that it can read. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Lee says that Dave should have a bit less caffeine. No doubt. No doubt. Um, and then did we answer Timothy's question? Can AD Explorer snapshot be accessed read via PowerShell? We, we did we answer that question. question. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a hard time keeping up. <laughs> Joel, Joel, says, uh, Joel asked, does AD Explorer captured image also capture labs passwords? So it's only going to capture the attributes that you're allowed to read. And if my privileges don't allow me to read uh, those attributes, I'm not gonna be able to find it. So to add uh, a little bit to what Dave said about naming conventions, I love it when um, the workstations and laptops are named with the username in it. It's quite common, we see that very, it's, it's, it's easy for the admins, it's easy for the organization to see, or for the, for example, for the help help desk, when they, you know, when when John Deere calls and says my my laptop's on the Fritz, they know which machine it is because his name is in the name embedded in the name of the machine. But that makes our job easier because oftentimes on pen tests, and certainly this would apply to attackers too, you're targeting someone. So if you're looking for uh, the CEO's workstation, so you can get those credentials that makes it very simple to find. And of course, ADS Explorer um, just lays that out for you. How handy. Yeah, very handy. Um, so, so another- asked, uh, uh, when, when Citrus is vulnerable, what has gone wrong with the configuration? A lot of times what I've seen in, in environments where I've been able to get on onto a Citrix box, 
it's that the admins have added domain users to the local admins group. And then once that has happened, you know, anybody who's using that Citrix server is going to have a hash in memory. Okay. And then Martin asks, I would be interested to hear more about what kind of things are usually looked for when running proc dump. I know you mentioned that the rename, but what other things are there that you can do to avoid detection? That's it depends on the, what the organization is, is looking for. I mean, proc dump is very popular and LSAS memory scraping is a very widely well-known technique. So uh, if they're looking for it, then, uh, you know, if you're using the proc dump um, system internals tool, they're probably going to uh, see it. They should also see uh, dumping LSAS from uh, task manager, or using uh, PowerShell and many antivirus uh, uh, products uh, alert on pretty much anything trying to interact with LSAS that's not normal. Are there I'm other yes. tools that can do the same thing? Uh, with regard to uh, AD Explorer or with uh, ProcDump? I, th I think you're asking uh, AD Explorer. <laughs> Do people really put passwords in the description box? They yes. do. <laughs> people, if Especially people are using Google summer process. 2018, yes, yes, they do. And you know, in their defense, they do because they don't realize that any that these attributes are read are readable by anyone. So they don't realize that, or they wouldn't do it. But um, but they are. So <laughs> we find that pretty frequently. Um, there's several built-in attributes, uh, user password, Unix user password, they're listed here, but the schema can be expanded and there could be custom attributes as well. Uh, comment, description, info, those are all common attributes that will have, that will be populated with information that may or may not be helpful to us, but oftentimes will contain a password or uh, instructions about a particular machine or all kinds of user uh, helpful information. This this example on this slide sh shows the user password field populated with uh, its numbers here, but it's just decimal ASCII values. So you just convert those, and you can. It's easy to convert that password. Um, I very recently on a test found I, I I got internal access. The first thing I did was take my AD Explorer snapshot, which I always do. I looked for user passwords. I found one from a fairly privileged user, and I was elevated and, and pivoting within five minutes of starting the test just because I could read that attribute. So um, AD Explorer has a really handy search feature. So you can, in this case, you can select an attribute and then say, is that field not empty? So it will just look through the entire database and show you all the records where that where a certain field is not empty. So whether it's the user password field or the description field or the comment field, um, I do all those searches and find all kinds of goodies every single time I run it. And I've seen exactly the same thing in multiple tests, uh, high privileged accounts, uh, many of them service accounts that have the user attribute or the, the user password attribute populated and it's instant creds. It's the equivalent of running GPV password as soon as you get on the network, uh, mm -hmm. but just looking in the Active Directory schema. Yep. Uh, Mike asked, go ahead. Sometimes the Unix user password be, will be populated, but yep. then you try that password on the for their Windows account and it works too. So password reuse. And Mike asked, do you do you rename the sys internals tools when you use them on a pen test? I don't think I have ever renamed any of the tools. I have never either. And I've only been caught using AD Explorer one time out of the many, Mike, many, many times I've used it. I think it was Martin that mentioned that he was caught with proc dump. I've been caught with proc dump, uh, but then I usually just pivot to a different uh, different tool. And he did ask if there were uh, equivalent functionality with uh, ProcDump 
You've got procdump.ps1, which is a Power, PowerShell script. Uh, in addition, you can dump that process memory using Task Manager if it's available in the Windows version uh, that you're using. Uh, and you know all of that, for instance, uh, you can take uh, the procdump.ps1 uh, PowerShell script and then incorporate it and use it in PowerLine, uh, which was developed by Brian Furman. Uh, but again, it depends on how much that endpoint protection suite is uh, instrumenting the L LSAS.exe process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the that I can't remember his or her name, but whoever asked about uh, renaming the the executable that's files, that's a good point because um, we we do find that sometimes organizations are only looking at file name. Hopefully, they're looking at maybe the hash of the file, um, but the hash of the file is pretty easy to change too. You could use a hex editor, change one, you know, comment character in the in the executable file, and then rename it and run that, and it would have a different name and a different hash. Um, that's possible too. Okay, more AD Explorer, Dave. So uh, on top of that. Um looking at plain text fields, we also do some password uh, analysis. All of the information that you need for analyzing users' passwords is right in the Active Directory schema, even though you don't have access to those hashes. I can use fields like password last set and user account control to try to identify accounts that may be more vulnerable than others. Uh, so for instance, when I see a password last set field, with 0x0 zero zero in it, typically that means either the password's not required, in which case I probably can't log into it, or the password has expired. And if I know a default password, I can probably use that on the account and get access. Again, that my prerequisite there is I know something about the account. In addition, if I look at user account control, that's gonna tell me exactly how that account is configured. So I can look at the account and I can tell whether the account is an enabled or disabled, whether password never expires is set, or whether uh, reversible encryption is used in Active Directory itself. So by targeting those specific accounts, maybe I can identify service accounts that I might be able to attack or how many of your executives are required to change their passwords and how strong are those passwords? This gives me an easy way to identify mm -hmm. those specific accounts that might be most uh, most appealing to me. <laughs> the, one, the one issue with uh, AD Explorer in this respect is sorting on that password last set uh, attribute. The password last set attribute sort is uh, from what I can tell, exactly how it's displayed numerically. So it's going to sort by the month first, then the day, then the year. If you're looking for old passwords, this becomes kind of a pain because now I have to look uh, for that month, identify the old passwords in that month, move down to the next month and day, and do the same thing over and over again. So Aww. it's kind of a double sort issue. And looking into those user account control. Uh, values, the attribute values, is way worth it. Uh, the references on the slide are excellent. Uh, the Jack Stromberg reference, I use it almost every time that I want to look at different attributes in, uh, in Active Directory. It's awesome. Was there a question, Sierra? Um, Corey asked this before we got to this slide, kind of, um, but have you run into engagements that blacklist such applications from running on a non-admin workstation? If if they're if they're blacklisting, usually it's we can't run pretty much anything that we want to run on that workstation. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but those organizations are few and far between, from my experience. Would you agree, Sally? I would agree, and um, these are Microsoft signed tools. So even if they're blacklisting things. They may not be blacklisting this, they are these tools. But I've, like I said, I've only been caught using AD Explorer once and I've, and other tools never. So, yeah. Well, PS Exec will get caught I, probably most frequently. 
Um, I think it was a, a mic that said, or no, it was Martin, I think, uh, that said uh, it allows you to guess the correct season and year. That is absolutely correct. <laughs> <laughs> if you can see yeah. when the password was set, yeah, you have a pretty good chance of using season and year and getting a correct uh, hit. Yeah, so yep. that's a good point. Um, and Yaron has more of a comment, but he says your soap was probably blocks default PS exec by default, not necessarily variants of it with different hashes, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and Scott was thinking the same thing. Yep. So yeah, your mileage may vary is caveated with all of these tools because it really depends on the posture of the target organization. Uh, this is just another set of tools uh, that give you living off the land functionality if you can find them or get them into the environment. Right, and like we said, um, PowerShell can give you all this information too, but we are more and more frequently running into organizations that prevent us from using PowerShell or at least are detecting that we're using PowerShell and not detecting these. So here's another tool that we use fairly frequently. PS logged on shows you uh, who's logged on to the current computer or a remote computer. Um, why is that useful? You could do that with PowerShell too, but um, it's the use case that I use most often is I'll run maybe Bloodhound or Sharp Hound. I'll get a whole list of sessions. Who has sessions on what host in the network? Um, it can take a while to run. So by the time you either get the results or get around to use, using all the results, the information might be a little bit stale. Um, so just for a one-off check on a server, once you've found what uh, computer you wanna target, you can run PS logged on to see, hey, is that admin still logged on there? Um, so it's just a quick way to find out who's, who's logged on either remotely, you could do it remotely, but who's logged on locally or via resource shares. Um, Martin had a question again, which of these tools need admin and which don't? He said, I get that the AD tool does not need, but was wondering about some of the others. The, uh, the ones that probably stick out the most are gonna be proc dump and PS exec. So this you, log don't, you don't need PS exec to admin to run it. You need it if you wanna run it with the administrator, yeah. Yeah. If I wanna do useful things with it. Yeah. <laughs> So the next tool that we decided to cover is strings. And somebody asked earlier on uh, whether or not there was a Windows equivalent to, this, to the Nix strings command. And there actually is, uh, provided by Sys internals. And it, does, it works very similar to Linux and Unix strings, uh, except that uh, it'll automatically decode uh, big and little Indian and, um, uh, and Unicode strings without requiring any other uh, command line arguments. Again, what I would typically use this for is I would uh, run it against either a binary that I found on the machine or a process that's running on the machine that I'm interested in. So again, I would look at services control panel applet, figure out what accounts are being used to log on to specific services, dump the memory for that particular process and then run it through strings and see if anything interesting pops out. Additionally, on tests, we've used this to analyze custom binaries on target machines. So you have some custom binary that uh, instruments the machine and reports back to some database. I run strings against that application and maybe I get credentials out. It could be credentials for a, uh, a domain user, or I could get SQL credentials. Once I have SQL credentials, I can use tools like Power Up SQL to try to escalate privilege on that target server. So it becomes very, very useful. And in this case, I, I just built a C-sharp sharp application with some interesting strings in it, uh, executed it, and then dumped the memory, and then analyzed the C-sharp binary on disk and I came up with the same thing. So I've got credit card information, domain credentials. Uh, it is not uncommon to find these things. And the best way to protect against them is one, use secure means of uh, 
executing applications with alternate credentials. Uh, if you need to install it as a service, that's the traditional way to do it. Uh, binary protection on any um, any of the applications that you're uh, developing locally. So what I want to do is make it as hard as possible for you to reverse engineer the application and, and then obfuscate or encrypt all of the strings that are in there. And there are tons of free and uh, commercial uh, tools that will do that for you. Hey, Sally, somebody like that SQL service account. Yeah. Um. Martin just said this was the best presentation so far. He loves it and finds it very useful. Well, thanks for being on, Martin. Well, you thank Microsoft it. because, <laughs> and it's free. Um, okay. Yep. Were you done, Dave? Did you have something no, to I'm add? I'm done, I'm done. Okay. Okay, auto runs. So sysadmins know auto runs. Uh, if you've done any forensics, you know auto runs. It's a GUI tool. Um, well, there's the command line version too, the auto runs C. Um, it basically enum looks through the registry and finds all the locations where things, when a computer boots up or a user logs on, the auto start uh, entry points. So it, what an attacker might use it for, a pen tester, is to look at those locations and see if you can insert your own method of persistence into one of those paths or files that's being run or batch file or login script or whatever it is, you can look through these and, and maybe it will help you achieve persistence. Um, additionally, if maybe you can't, you don't have access to the services.exe app and you're interested in looking at services, you can see them here. There's a, um, there's a tab for services and it will show you all the services. So it, somewhat useful uh, in that way too. So this just shows you how to run it. You From the command line, you just type auto runs to, to launch the GUI, but you can also run it and do more targeted uh, executions with the command line version. So the, the dash A tells it which type of logon you're looking for, which, which type of auto run you're looking for. And this one, the L, is the logon auto runs and then you can output it to a file the minus c is the csv format but it has a lot of options so that you can generate various types of output and then you can parse that output or maybe generate scripts from that output that are helpful and so this just bear in mind that this is a lot of the stuff that powerapp.ps1 does in the background so mm -hmm. uh, and trying to do that stuff manually is horribly painful if you don't have a tool like this. And this just makes it so much nicer. So Evan asked, do you need to download sysinternals after you own a target box? Can't they detect you downloading it? So yeah, <laughs> go ahead, Sally. They can detect you downloading it if they're if they're watching for that, right? But if, if. Yeah not usually the case and again they're signed so typically signed by microsoft means it's okay um and brian says yeah they wouldn't see much because most analysts sees what microsoft downloads but he he keeps saying the same thing but before you do so <laughs> <laughs> this time he wasn't quite fast enough. He should do the webcast. Uh, well, we love guest webcasts. <laughs> Heck yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Next slide. Yep. Sorry, I'm trying to. I lost my questions. So now, now I can't do Sierra's job anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because you're so ADD. Like, John, you need to do like too many things at once to really feel like you're like productive. <laughs> Well, and it's, again, I get excitable, so. You? Line, you get excitable? Focus, Dave. Well, the next, the next uh, utility that we decided, actually the next two, uh, they do very similar things, and you could kind of interchange what we identified here. On the first slide, what we're showing is 
actually doing um, a service binary evaluation. So like I said, Power Up typically looks at service bi binaries, identifies which ones you might be able to control and or overwrite. And if you can overwrite any of them and they're running as local system, it gives you the opportunity to escalate privilege on that target machine. So what I've got uh, in these particular screen captures is access check, checking with uh, the, the SID of the local users group and enumerating uh, the permissions on each of the services running on my target machine. And it tells me that I have read write access to WMI AP SRV. Well, that becomes interesting to me. If I can stop and start that service and it's running as local uh, local system, I'm very interested in whether or not I can overwrite that binary. Uh, so I can use auto runs or uh, the services control panel applet or WIMIC to identify the actual service binary. And in this case, it's sitting at C Windows System 32 WBEM uh, WMI AP serve.exe. Again, I can use access check and then identify the actual effective permissions on that particular binary. If I find that it's writable, then I can overwrite that binary and trojanize uh, that machine and get it to do my bidding, whether it be execute a C2 session or add a user to the machine. And we can do this at scale by uh, you know, automation. I can get a full list of all the services on the machine. I can run it through access check. I can look at all of those service binary locations. And then, I mean, this is exactly what PowerUp does when it does service binary evaluation on a target. Yeah, and you can use this to discover permissions for any file or folder. It's not restricted to services, of course, but it basically is just enumerating permissions. Um, Brian asks, what, from a detection standpoint, do you see much, do you see this being detected much? I've never seen this be detected, ever, Me ever. So like Dave said, access enum, that's a, that's a GUI version. Access check is a, is a command line only. Access enum is GUI. You basically, you see, you can point to a directory or the registry and you just click scan and it will tell you who has access where. Um, it's really fast too, it's very fast. Um, I used this recently to, I had a customer with very tight NTFS permissions on the file system and I wanted to put a link file somewhere that I could point the icon back to my share so that I could capture hashes, but I couldn't find a writable location and if you have to manually search for a writable location, it can take forever. So access enum, you just click scan. And I found a couple locations and was able to uh, put a file there and did end up getting hashes that way. Um, so it does the hard work for you, the tedious work for you. Um, Jason, oh, sorry, go ahead, David. In this environment, that J, that J Strand user is a loose cannon. <laughs> his domain users has access to his home directory. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Jason brought up a good point, and a couple other people have made it, but I wanted to say it for the recording. Um, his comment was, that's a great thing about running sys internals. In every mid-large org, I've worked at the domains, use it so much that when anyone sees it, they ignore it. It's just assumed to be other admins, even if it's alerted. They just ignore the alert and assume it's an admin because who else would be using it? So, yeah. But that's yeah, the nice thing about using these if tools. You're, if you're using stolen admin credentials to run it, then it's definitely a Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Dave, you want to take this one? Oh, uh, sure. Uh, this one's a little bit of a stretch. Um, uh, if you look at Active Directory, um, when objects are deleted, they're not uh, not necessarily deleted forever. Uh, objects can be tombstoned in Active Directory, and then you can use a tool like AD Restore to restore one of those tombstoned 
uh, items. That way you don't have to look for an account to take over. You can just use a deleted account that you've resurrected and then change the password, enable the account, add it to whatever uh, groups that you want, and then assume that identity. Again, uh, so this particular tool, if I'm going to do this, I have to be a domain ad admin already. And this is more, more or less uh, a covering your tracks and, and leaving yourself another access method uh, that may not get caught by the target organization. So if you look at the uh, screen captures, we're doing exactly that with that J Strand account again. So uh, we're changing his password to summer 2008. Wasn't that the password before? <laughs> and, that, and, the password and then we're enabling his, his account. And then we're going to add him to domain admins. And nobody's going to be the wiser because, well, Jay Strand used to work here. And how often do departments talk to one another within an organization? <laughs> do you, know, uh, do you know everyone who works there? Probably not. Yeah, and some organizations will alert on uh, authentication attempts for disabled accounts, but by re-enabling the account, you're obviously bypassing that. So I don't know how many organizations alert on previously disabled accounts that are now enabled. I, I couldn't say, but I've never seen it. Um, Tyler had a question. Would the access check utilization be limited to local machines or could it be used on the file share network drive? Sorry, can you read that again, Sierra? Yes, would the access check utilization be limited to local machines or could it be used on a file share slash network drive? I don't think you can use it for a UNC path, but if you map the network drive, it's just as good. Uh, can you, no, can you use I- it for a UNC I path, believe, Sally? I believe you can, as long as you have access to that share, yep. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yep. Okay. Okay, EFS dump. So this one is a bit of a stretch too. It's not something I've ever used on a test, but I could see where it could it could be possible. Um, so encrypting file system, that's a window, Windows encryption. I don't know how many people use it anymore uh, since BitLocker has been around, but it, it's still possible. There's There are tools like cipher.exe, that's a built-in tool. It's not a sysinternals tool, but it's a built-in Windows tool that can detect encrypted files, but also EFS dump. You can run that to detect where the encrypted file shares are. Um, typically, you encrypt things because you're trying to protect them because they contain juicy information, right? So it, it gives you a sense for where the good stuff is. Uh, once you find them, you've either found an interesting location that may have other things, or you've uh, you've found something that contains interest, interesting information, and then you would need to decrypt it. There is a Mimikatz uh, module that will help with this. I have not, uh, disclaimer, I have not tried this, but I, I put the link there that I found that walks through how to do that, um, and I plan on checking that out because it could be it could be interesting. Um, but typically on a test, you do hunt around for sensitive information. So this is just one of the many things you could do looking for that sensitive information. Um, Martin had a couple questions. How about WIP and EFS? They are similar things. Is WIP the new EFS? Curious if this would work with WIP. WIP, I don't know what WIP is. It's Windows Information Protection, yeah. Aha. But I don't think it's going to work with uh, with EFS. I mean, this was uh, this was created when when EFS was you know prime. Uh, I don't know if if WIP will be detected uh, in the same fashion as uh, as it as it is with EFS dump. Oh, is that how you say it, WIP? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. It sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Were there other questions at that? Um, Yaren had another question. From a blue team defender's point of view, what Windows log events can be sent to a seam to alert us to a live use of PSExec or a variant of on a remote machine? 
I believe service creation and service start are going to be the two biggest ones. And if you're instrumenting on uh, on those events, you're probably going to see it. And that'll be coupled with log on events, right? Yep, yep. Yep. Um, quick question for you guys. How many slides do you have left? This is the last this slide. Oh, okay. Let's do the last slide, do the t-shirt and answer these last questions. Okay. So there are far more sysinternals tools than we have listed here, but we kind of picked out the ones that we find have some offensive potential because that's our angle, right? Um, we've listed them in categories uh, conveniently, but there, there are probably others as well. We, we, I mean, there are so many different tools that do so many interesting things. So if anybody knows of good uses, attack uses for any of these tools that we haven't talked about, we'd love to hear about it. Awesome. Uh, and many of these are just kind of, as we were going through, we were coming up with use cases for how we might be able to use uh, specific tools. Uh, that definitely does not mean that we've used all of them during a test. We definitely have our favorites though. Now I see SIG check there under re reconnaissance. I've used that recently to um, determine version numbers for like on an internal test. You find a certain type of uh, application, you wanna know what version it's running to see if you can find any exploits for it. Um, SIG check will give you version information. Okay, okay. well. Any more questions? There are, but before we do that, because we're running out of time, so I want to make sure that we announce the t-shirt winner, which is Mar, and then last name C-I-N. If you are still on, let me know in the questions, and if you're not, if you didn't reply to me, then I'm going to pick the next person. What's the t-shirt? Which one? Um, the t-shirt is still the Choose Wisely one, but this time I'm going to throw in a dice. Ooh, nice. Okay. Oh, look at that. Nice. That's an old, that's a classic. The sneakers t-shirt. Do you have any right. of those? No, we don't. Oh, too bad. Okay. I don't see anything from um, that person. So the next person is Paul Taylor, which I saw Paul Taylor show up in the questions. So I know that he's around, but I don't know. Is hey, he maybe. Does that mean something? Oh, yes, Paul Taylor, um, that's you. So email me, sierra at bhis.co, lucky ducks. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, the rest of you didn't get one, but um, come back again. And John points out that it is a die, not a dice. So um, maybe I was going to send more than one, John. <laughs> um, and a lot of people said this was their favorite webcast in a long time. So that is pretty much a huge compliment, David and Sally. Awesome. But, um, we have a few more questions. So if you need to leave, you can, but we're, we are recording this and we'll go through and ask the, the other questions we had. So Mike asks, what's the best way to be notified when one of these sys internal tools gets updated to a newer version? Yeah, as far as I know, there's no automatic updates for these, um, but the, there's a SysInternals website devoted to these tools, so they would announce it. Um, there might be some RSS feed thing that you can, or a Twitter feed that you can hop on. I, I don't know. I just, I check it occasionally. Okay. But it's uh, not, like, they're not the kind of tools that get updated every month. Let's put it that way. And, but they do get the way that we use them, uh, we're usually downloading them fresh to a machine that we've just gotten control of, uh, or we just live off the land with what's on the network. I guess probably the easiest way might be to use live.sysinternals.com to execute them. And then you always have the latest greatest, yep. Okay. Um, can we get a copy of this presentation? Yes, we always record all our presentations. So this will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. Um, Scott said, thank you all for giving me some tools that you use for red team activities. Now I need to run these tools to see what data I need to clean up in the AD. Yes, exactly. you do. And that's like the point of pen testing so that like you guys can be better. Yep. So that's awesome, Scott, way to go. Um, Casey said, these tools obviously have legitimate uses. What should a blue teamer do? Alerting on the use of these tools might cause alarm fatigue 
are these tools you recommend alerting over others? I, I think the best strategy is application whitelisting and then make sure that those tools are protected. Uh, a lot of times when we find them, they're on uh, network shares that have read access to anyone in the domain, which gives us the access to copy them and execute them on any machine that we want to. Uh, so even if you're deploying them as a, as a component of the base image, you have to make sure that the NTFS permissions are set up properly to prevent people who you don't want peering into Active Directory from getting to them. And how about this, Dave? I have never done this, but I think I'm going to now that I'm thinking about it. Um, if you have write access to the sys internal share, plant a trojanized version of one of the executables. That sounds awesome. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, have a great week, guys, and we will see you next week when we come back with Attack Tactics with John Strand. So I will be sending out that registration information soon, but have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.